Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, by weekly talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Created by Think Tank Hawaii and Kingsfield Law Office. Our guests share their life stories, journey to the United States, or their ancestor journey to the United States, and their contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is Tova Flagger. Welcome, Tova. Hi there. Hello. Aloha. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. Well, we are honored to have you. And you are a licensed attorney in Minnesota, and you currently focus on environment and environmental justice issues in the St. Croix watershed, and where you work in the University of Wisconsin system as a lecturer and a sustainability professional. You teach the topics including sustainable land use law, environmental policy, environmental sustainability justice, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Your education includes a 2006 Juris Doctorate degree, cum laude, from the University of Minnesota Law School in Minnesota. What a coincidence. I graduated from the same law school in the same year. <laughs> I feel like you look familiar. Yeah, it's wonderful to reconnect with you, Tova, on this it's platform. Great. It has been how many years we graduated? I, I, I lost count. It's, it's, it's better to just lose just count and let it be. <laughs> Exactly. The richness of the years. And well, after law school, you were a much better law student than I I was. You were cum laude. I didn't, you know, with any honors. But after law school, you have uh, working very hard. But let's start with you, uh, family. And because the topic of the show is a nation of immigrants, and you you told me you are a first generation immigrant. And do you know how your ancestors settled in this country? Well, we know, um, and I'm saying we because I have not done any of this homework myself, but my mother and some other relatives have done some genealogy and we're more fortunate than most that we've got some, we've got some stories, we've got some uh, records that we can rely on, unlike mm -hmm. um, many others who have come to many other countries around the world who uh, weren't able to bring anything or were um, brought um, by force themselves. So um, we have some, we don't have everything, uh, but mm -hmm. I have some uh, some stories here. Before I get into that, I just have to, uh, there's a couple of things I have to push back on. One, um, I never took law school in, a for, in like a different language than my original birth mm -hmm. language. So um, just on the cum laude and everything, I, I did try to, uh, take some literature courses in St. Peter St. Petersburg, Russia, and um, it was it was challenging mm. <laughs> to say the least. And that wasn't law school, so yeah. That, um, that's that's uh, what what year was that? That was uh, before your law school, right? After oh college. yeah, in undergrad, I I lived right. in St. Petersburg, Russia uh, yeah. during undergrad via Grinnell College, and so they had this fabulous study abroad program. And uh, I know now that. You're teaching undergraduate students sometimes, so I hope that you also encourage them to study abroad where possible. Oh, yeah. I think it's Definitely. so enriching, and it uh, was uh, maybe one of the first things that opened up my um, understanding of intersectionality of sustainability issues, where mm. you know that it's the Venice of the North, St. Petersburg, Russia, all of these canals but they were all so polluted in 1997 when oh I was my. there. And I asked people, well, why aren't we doing anything with this terrible water? And people were basically saying, you know, we're really trying to make a living and trying to get food on the table and have some uh, overall stability. So having the canals be cleaned up is not the first priority. And so having, you know, just a little inkling of understanding where people are coming from is something that I have tried to develop awareness of ever since then. But yeah, we... I absolutely <laughs> appreciated the, the the anecdotes, and uh, I, there are so many things I can relate. 
you know, I grew up in China in 1980s, 90s, and uh, it was the economy was booming, but uh, the environment was heavily, heavily polluted. And uh, a few years ago, I went to Florida, a small town in Florida near Jacksonville, and the, the, the air just smells so awful. I asked people what's going on. They said there was a paper mill factory owned by Coach Brothers, just discharging you know, polluted water in the river. And nobody did anything about it because they provide basically uh, a, a jobs to uh, half of the population. So I know exactly what you're talking about, that uh, there's a balance, you know, where we need to, should we develop it first and then take care of the environment later? But that may be too late, don't you think, Ova? There's a sense of urgency. And I think but, more and more people are um, becoming aware of that urgency. So I would completely agree. And I'm smiling at the paper mill factory because there's a case I teach some of my students in land use law about mm -hmm. a... Uh, a paper bag factory, a paper mill, wow. um, yeah. back in the 1800s. And some of the land use um, issues, are we going to have this economy with this paper factory? Or are we going to have clean water? Because um, <clears throat> the uh, downstream farmers and, and residents were not too happy with paper mill back in the 1800s. So mm -hmm. um, with your story, obviously, we still have some work to do. And uh, we've made some some progress and uh, maybe it's a two steps forward, one step back or some other dance version. I'm not sure, but yeah. 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 Well, uh, you, you are very few people I know so razor focused on, you know, environmental issues. Yeah. Through your uh, professional and educational career uh, journey, how have you experienced to shape your current focus? on environmental and sustainability issues, particularly in St. Croft's watershed in this particular area? Well, um, it's very selfish if I'm going to be fully uh, fully transparent. I have some um, a, a place right near where I teach in River Falls, Wisconsin, where my family has, uh, um, some family has lived there for mm. decades and then uh, moved away, so it was not being taken care of, and so I moved out here to take care of some mm. uh, some of the land and try to restore some of it. And I, um, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about thinking of our fabulous Midwestern water, Minnesota, Wisconsin. Yep. We've got so many lakes, so many rivers, so much fishing, all of this wonderful um, nature around us, and. I was getting delicious tasting water from my well on this property and come to find out the nitrates are just going in the wrong direction. They're a, a little higher than you want for drinking water. And so um, applying our law background, looking into what are the uh, legal limits, different restrictions, uh, it's really challenging for somebody who is uh, on a private well system in Wisconsin to get well water testing, to get um, information. And mm -hmm. uh, this was several years ago. It's actually improved in my area since I uh, came to this realization. And there is an increase in free well water testing. But oh. any of my neighbors uh, could not afford yearly well water testing. So I would get our... Um, are well tested and then give all the information out to my neighbors. <laughs> wow. And well, that, uh, yeah, it got me interested a, in taking it further. Well, that's a wonderful thing for you to do. Is uh, you know, I, I, a few years ago, I had a, a, a chance to test uh, some water quality and uh, I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. And I called so many people in the government and in the university, and they, everybody gave me, uh, you know, different answers. So I can I can definitely, you know, relate to your story that for normal folks and not not very easy and uh, to to understand the, the the complications and even to figure out what the procedures are to protect themselves. So you are doing a wonderful a wonderful job to help the the, the community. And uh, you are both teaching and uh, practicing, and uh, giving your background in in law, and uh, we graduate from the same law school, 
and your current role as a lecturer of sustainability profession. Now, now how do you integrate the legal framework into your teaching and on sustainable land use law and environmental policy? So, do, uh, are they re uh, closely related or you separate them? My poor students, I think everything is related and I think everything has a uh, connection to our legal policies and framework um, that we're working under in terms of sustainability and land use. Um, and I'm going to have to backtrack just a little to say that my work isn't mine. <laughs> there are so many people. One of the reasons that I started teaching at university um, was this well water and I'm not a scientist. I'm a lawyer uh, by training, so finding uh, folks at the UW system who were uh, working with hydrology and finding um, water testing through the counties, et cetera, and connecting all of this was really um, something that I've been working on, but none of the science, none of the uh, um, product is mine. I'm just uh, one one little piece of it all, and that's the other uh transitioning back to your recent question, that's sort of what I have been realizing as I'm teaching different sustainability classes is that we've got these different lenses, different frameworks, and uh, policy really undergirds so much of the undergraduate experience. Um, and so much of our daily experience is just steeped in law, whether we realize it or not. So if you're a student, if you're signing that loan, uh, agreement or uh, your first apartment when you're moving to school or, um, you know, the all of the app agreements on our phone are some of the examples I use for students to get that realization that policy and law is sort of ubiquitous and mm -hmm. learning enough about it to work um, and get things done is is valuable. But it's not not the be all end all. And there are so many aspects of it around the world that um, I think have to have to start coming into the picture. Um, so I am. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And uh, uh, could you describe a specific project or initiative you were undertaken in the St. Croix watershed that you feel particularly proud of and what impact it has had on the uh, community and the environment. So you've been working on this in this area for quite long, 10 years? For a few years. Well, um, almost, almost 10 almost. years now. Wow. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it all started from um, my selfish desire for clean water from my family well and uh, connecting with the university. I connected with a, a watershed steward training that was happening through uh, an EPA Environmental Protection Agency uh, uh, grant to mm -hmm. the St. Croix watershed here in Western Wisconsin. And taking part in that, I became a volunteer and um, we started trying to basically address as many issues as possible throughout the 8,000 square mile. And it's um, oh my. somewhere close to 20,700 plus square kilometers <laughs> for, for those who uh, use a more cultured metric system. Um, but it's it's a lot. It's a lot of space. And we have um, volunteers throughout the watershed, but um, not a lot of funding. It's not a an incredibly um, resource-rich area necessarily. And so we have done some work, which got some recognition and won some awards to really uh, boost the work and then started a collaboration with different counties, uh, specifically uh, Washington County in the St. Croix watershed area. And so we've managed to network and collaborate and really expand um, projects that started small and keep that local attention and that local awareness of what's happening which I think is very important to have people who really have lived in an area and know the land and water to have that uh, input um, into what happens if there's going to be funding and ability to to do something to improve or maintain it. Um, but yeah, we have uh, managed to 
complete several projects in terms from research to education to outreach, and it's multiple small projects throughout the St. Croix watershed, um, but it has leveraged um, multiple times the original grants and awards and mm -hmm. uh, continues with just different energy from um, disaster recovery from natural storms and weather events to uh, water pollution, uh, addressing things like well water, testing, et cetera. And I just am thrilled to be working with such great people in the St. Croix watershed. Um, Northwoods and Waters of the St. Croix uh, has been a uh, partner with the St. Croix watershed stewards and the universities. And it's just been a great collaboration all around. Well, so wonderful to hear. And uh, the, I congratulate you to your tremendous accomplishment. And I hope you get, and your team, will get all the support you need to continue the good work. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, you are not a scientist. Me neither. You and I both studied arts and literature in undergraduate, and then we received legal education. And uh, But you have been working with uh, people in in in, in the science, uh, er, scientific area. And how has your uh, understanding of environmental justice evolved? And how do you address the complexities of these issues in your work and the teaching? I mean, not only uh, to uh, related to the uh, science, but also other aspects of the environmental ju justice. Well, to address that, mm -hmm. if you'll indulge me, I'll go back and uh, try to answer your very first question with uh, where did I come from? Ancestor story. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. So this is yeah. Nation of Immigrants, uh, this broadcast that I so very much appreciate. And um, I wanted to just address um, so some of my family were brought over as indentured servants. Some came over uh, mm -hmm. mostly from uh, the British Isles, uh, Western Europe area. And mm -hmm. we've got uh, some stories dating back to uh, Civil War, colonial uh, wow. That's a lot. area. Yeah. And, and, um, but just to note, um, a lot of the stories do address that we were coming to a place where people were already living. So mm -hmm. I, um, it, as I've gotten older, we grew up with these stories of the dreaded scout, um, uh, Benjamin Whitcomb, who was an ancestor of mine who fought in the civil war and, uh, was so clever hiding in hollow logs and, reattaching cobwebs across the top of the hollow log so that the red coat army wouldn't find him. And it was very, you know, romantic sort of to uh, a child to think of these daring exploits. Um, then learning a little more and learning where some of his awareness of how to function in this land came from indigenous people who were already here and who um, were getting forced off the land. Um, in part by my ancestors, keeping some of that awareness uh, and and really starting to learn and address. And I think as we um, who are immigrants, and then one quick stop in 1938, and then I'm going to come back to the present and wrap it all up. But yes. um, there's a Good time. connection that um, some of my um, East Coast relatives have with an uh, organization, Daughters of the American Revolution, and I'm not um, as familiar with them, so um, somebody's going to school me on it if they see this recording. But um, there was a an, an organization and uh, President uh, FDR um, Roosevelt was retorting to them because they didn't like a lot of his policies. And he said, you know, Daughters of the American Revolution, it's important that we remember that you and I especially are descendant from immigrants and revolutionists and mm -hmm. that um, we have these maybe people who have some resources um, that are immigrants and that we have to both acknowledge where we have landed and to take care of that land and then acknowledge, you know, that that balance of resources um, with how to respect where we've landed and this this area that's nurturing us now. Um, so I I think I am trying to have that inform more of my work. Mm. Um, and I think the complexities are 
um, multitudinous, but uh, multitudinal. Yes, <laughs> there's there is um, a lot that we can do just to acknowledge that um, many of us, even if we have this, whether it's science or literature or law, this background in formal study, not necessarily the expert in sustainable land use if we're not, you know, familiar with the land or water of a place. And there's a lot of traditional environmental or traditional ecological knowledge that is being um, addressed and uh, recognized a little bit more recently that mm -hmm. was covered up for the longest time. And uh, so I think just recognizing that we're not necessarily the experts in how to uh, solve some of the sustainability issues and, and the environmental issues. And I think the justice part is really not only the acknowledgement, but if we have the resources to put some, mm -hmm. some time and effort towards um, doing something about it. And I would also recognize that we're being hosted by the uh, um, lovely islands of Hawaii. And so mm -hmm. looking at environmental justice and environmental uh, work, there's a lot of traditional ecological knowledge that is resurging um, in Hawaii currently. And just a shout out to everybody who's working on that and trying to uh, keep the islands from um, being the extinction capital of the world, which is what unfortunately Hawaii has been called due to some of the uh, less careful movement of, of our species around the planet. So, um, well, that's... excellent. <laughs> well, well, very well said. Thank you so much, Tova. Now let's change to a, a little bit lighter topic. And oh, uh, it's been a while <laughs> since we graduated law school. And I've been thinking, because I never leave Minneapolis, so I've, I've been back to the U, U of M all the time. And now reflecting on your time and our times at the U of M, University of Minnesota Law School, Mondale Hall, and what are the most memorable mm -hmm. moments you still cherish from the law school? Well, obviously our debate, Shang. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we yes. Was that legal writing, I think, the very first year? Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I for sure, I, I really, it was memorable to get to meet people who were passionate about uh, learning and taking action. And it was memorable uh, also for me to get to work with the uh, law school clinics. So that was an opportunity to take what we were learning and then immediately apply it to the benefit of the community, whether it was uh, I uh, helped start the immigrant or the sorry, the workers rights clinic uh, mm -hmm. at the U of M while we were there. But there was immigration law, there was tax law, there were all sorts of uh, family law clinics and all sorts of ways to uh, really apply the learning that we had um, and and help people at the same time. So that was oh. a kind of memorable part of our school background. But how about you? Well, it's embarrassing to say that I, I'm not sure you still remember that uh, the law school parking lot and uh, there was a, a tenant. And now it's, everything is automatic uh, by machine. But uh, back in, when we were in law school and uh, there was a tenant in the parking lot and his uh, shift as a midnight. And so basically all the st a lot of students waiting in the la law library until midnight when the shift ends, when the attendant left, the door <laughs> opened, that everybody just like, went to the parking lot and they drive, drive out of their cars for parking for free for the entire day, just to save a few bucks. And <laughs> we were poor law students, but that was the most memorable memory I had about law school. Obviously, there were a lot of fun and wonderful memories, but that oh. was just one thing I, I do want to, to mention, just to make you laugh. Yeah. It did. I and I have those memories. I tried to stay up till midnight, like all of you very hardcore studiers, and it did not do me any good. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I needed to go to bed way before that. My bedtime is earlier. Yeah, but... I, I totally you, you made the right decision. That's not worth it. <laughs> we did till midnight. And, and we are running a little bit behind time, but there are a couple of questions I do want to ask you about. The first question is uh you know, you 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 studied in Russia, uh, just study abroad, 
and uh, you'll, you're probably uh, uh, pretty familiar with Russian art and literature. And who is you? I'm, I grew up with Russian uh, literature and Slavic music. And uh, I was curious about uh, who's your favorite uh, novelist or author or who is your, and who is your favorite composer from that part of the world. We are going to have a much longer conversation about oh, yes. this, I hope. We should have but, a, um, a separate episode for that. Yes. <laughs> so I would I would um, say Bulgakov, Mikhail Bulgakov, uh, is mm -hmm. an author that I admire and um, writing about everything from being a doctor during war to uh, very fantastical aspects of literature with Master and Margarita. And yes. I, I want to say something very cultured for the music and... I do appreciate the Tchaikovsky, Prokofiev, um, but I've got to say my favorite Russian language music is probably all the pop and punk like uh, Dede oh, yes, that's cool. and <laughs> <laughs> Bravo and Kino. So, um, yes, but we'll have to chat and I would love to. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm eager to hear your recommendations. I should, you know, check them out. And uh, I grew up with Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff. But I'm a look. I also love rock and punk. Uh, next question is: Is there any specific books or movies that have deeply resonated with you, and you would recommend to our audience? That doesn't limit to a Russian literature uh, or sure. film. Well, um, a lot of mine are going to be uh, environmental and agriculture focused, but there is a fabulous independent documentary. Uh, Serán las Dueñas de, las, de la Tierra, uh, mm. and I'll just say it in English, excuse my Spanish, Dreams of Stewards of the Land. And so it's through Dreams New Day of Films. Dreams of the Land, okay. And it's uh, all about some young farmers who are trying to bring uh, healthy food to their community and agroecology to Puerto Rico and the challenges that they're facing, um, you know, um, all around. So it's a fabulous, well-done documentary. Um, there's also... Uh, we have PFAS, uh, uh, different um, carbon and uh, other pollutant issues in the forefront uh, of ag and uh, environment. And so dark water with Mark Ruffalo is something that my students have found mm. to be uh, helpful in getting behind some of that PFAS. And just to end, um, all sorts of books for okay. students. Uh, this is Vanessa Nakate, A Bigger Picture, um, just big like picture. Greta Thunberg. Yep, we've got um, all sorts of books and things to uh, to talk about some more, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we should we should definitely have a, a little... <laughs> separate episode about recommendations. But uh, indulge me for one last question, and in that normally we end off our show with our distinguished guest. If you could offer advice to your younger self in her 20s, what wisdom would you share? I was thinking about this and all I could think of was get working on climate issues sooner. So um, okay. we've, we've got so much and it's a rich world, a beautiful world, and there's so much to work on. But if we don't have a planet, then a lot of the rest of the stuff is a little less meaningful, I think. So um, that, that's, that's a great point. It's that, you know, the survival of our planet trumps everything. It, it takes top priority. I totally agree, Tova. And well, we're all in it together. It doesn't matter where you're from or where you've landed. We've got to mm -hmm. figure out this planet. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Tova, for your time and uh, for your uh, insights. I really appreciate your work you do, uh, you know, the environmental justice. And I congratulate to you for your accomplishment. And uh, sorry, we did uh, we ran out of time today. There are so many other questions I want to ask you. We'll definitely invite you back on the show, and we'll talk about more about you know other things, not too heavy topics, perhaps. But uh, <laughs> I will continue to keep my eye on your work uh, in the Cross uh, River watershed, and that's just uh, uh, so vitally important to our you know life in in the Midwest. Thank you so much, Tova. It's wonderful to have you here. Wonderful to reconnect. Thank you so much. Hey. Thank Good you. Night. Aloha.